design management and meeting information model. Excellent. So again, welcome. Um, I'm, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing to you, and this is an aspect of the event, Professor Steve Lockley, who will in turn <laughs> <laughs> introduce <laughs> our guest today. So the reason I'm doing this is because uh, Steve is a professor here at Northampton University and has kindly invited Steve to come and present. Um, and Steve will be the guest lecturer for tomorrow's session, so you know already uh, of him. So you want to introduce, as you said... Yes, I will do. Yeah. <laughs> this is Dr. Stephen Hamill. Uh, Steve and I go back probably 18 years, in the late 90s, late 90s. Late 90s. Yes. and we've worked together on basically over the last 15 years on developing BIM technologies, BIM software, uh, both in research in Newcastle University, and now Steve and I went out into industry and worked in industry. Steve now heads up building information modelling for the National Building Specification, which is part of the Royal Institute of British Architects. So he's... Um, He's risen to great heights. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll uh, just let you yeah, uh, I'll just go. start your presentation and we'll say more about the block rate tomorrow. So yeah, what I've got planned is I've got a 15 minute PowerPoint that just shows maybe a bit of the theory behind what we're trying to do. And then we've got 15 minutes looking at BIM objects that you put in tools such as Revit or HockeyCAD. And then 15 minutes looking at how that relates to specification properties. Now we do some questions. So it goes straight through, it's about 45 minutes, but if you want to ask questions as we go, it will stretch a bit, but I, I'm not in a rush to get off home, so however you want to play it. And I'm going to talk about yeah, the information that matters, building information modelling. Just a briefly look at how in a digital age the construction industry is adapting to these new digital technologies and process. What are the challenges ahead of us? and what support the industry needs to, to meet these challenges. In terms of our organisation, NBS, we're, we're owned by the Royal Institute of British Architects. So we're a private organisation that employs around 250 people, but our R&D department is about 30 technical authors, so architects are about 30 people as well. And we so define exactly what we want to do ourselves, but at the end of the year, all of our profit goes to the Royal Institute of British Architects, and that money is used uh, to promote architecture in the UK and to help UK companies. As uh, an organisation, MBS, we're best known for our specification software. The sort of template clauses for specifying things like the floor, and as well as your template clause, you get uh, technical guidance that helps you uh, specify building fabric engineering on, on construction projects. I started out studying at Durham University in the 90s, I studied structural engineering and then stayed on and did a PhD in the sort of analysis of uh, digital models, finite element modelling back then and actually having physical specimens as well. So what you see there is a reinforced concrete uh, beam con connection and I also had one of those on the computer to the, the final elements and make sure that they broke at the same time if you simulate the earthquakes so BIM if you like but back in the 90s and that joined Steve Lockley doing software products for MBS and I've gone from software developer to now so talking to our key clients teasing out their requirements and sort of defining how how our products are going to develop and what new products we need in industry. So digital construction age, you see other industries like the music industry, uh, it was probably only 10 years ago, you, people were having LPs and tape recorders and that's just out of the window now and people listen to music, digital MP3 players, playlists, iPhone genius, just buy the songs you want, it's completely revolutionised music. Now this week HMV the final nail on the coffin, the uh, big sort of high store, uh, high street store in the UK. And it's not just uh, music, movies, video players are a thing of the past now, and you get your movies streamed to whatever device you like to watch them on. By the and way, Blockbuster is now in talk with <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's <I'm> Blockbuster. <laughs> uh, and sales of books have gone this way, sales of digital uh, material has gone that way. 
So you've seen it in lots of different industries. What you say, H and B, blockbusters, Jessops. Uh, this is what's happening out there, and the same thing's happening in construction. Only back in the nineties, I was taught how to draw using a drawing board, pencil, rubber, uh, what it's called, set square, or whatever it is. And now, at universities like Northumbria, students are getting taught to generate three-dimensional models with uh, well-structured information. And there's still people out there that don't accept that this is happening. But if you don't accept that change is happening, this is the sort of thing that would happen to you, you, yourself, either as a professional or your organisation. The same thing that's happened to Kodak. So Kodak in the 1990s had a turnover of $16 billion. They were one of the top four or five American companies, had 90% of the market selling traditional cameras and film. And digital comes along and like, the trends are so obvious there, where they sort of fell off a cliff. And last year we're taking off the, the, the stock market. And I think that should be a lesson to the construction industry. That if as an organisation, the engineering practice, or architectural practice, contractor, if you don't recognise this is happening, th this could well be your, your organisation. What is digital construction? It's a combination of a lot of things. In, in my point of view, there's obviously the IT, the software side. You can't exist without that. You need to have skilled people whether it's skilling existing staff or the, the, the new breed coming through university and getting that process right, everyone agreeing the rules, how are we going to work together and collaborate. But I think all of that doesn't work, all of that falls to pieces if you haven't got the, the information right underneath. And that's the sort of focus of, of this presentation. Where are we now with BIM? If you go around some of the sort of leading architectural practices, so the likes of Ryder or Space Group in the, the northeast that you, you might get in talking to you. The fantastic way of visualising, instead of just seeing things in 2D, you can actually see things in 3D and move it around. You are selling the concept to a client, you can really sort of wow them. The client selling the future occupiers, you can really sort of picture uh, the design before it's built. And from that sort of geometry again, generate unlimited amount of drawings, taking slices through the model and there's a different plan. Show me a plan with just fittings on, make the rest invisible, there, there you go. Show me a fire strategy just with the sort of envelope with the rooms. Unlimited drawings you can generate from that model. And when you start to work together, say a structural engineer with a service engineer, you can eliminate the sort of clashes of well, like ducts and steel work before you actually go on site. So you're not experimenting for the first time with the real building, you're getting it right digitally. So that's happening at the moment, not in every practice, but uh, in a number of practices now, increasing number. Now it's time to focus on the information in BIM, and that's what our organisation sort of strategic focus is. What are the challenges? Like we'll go through each of these in a little bit of detail. Where do the information rich objects come from? What standards are the objects authored to? Oh, I have to jump all the way at the back of my grip and end. Let's just do it. Where will we? So it was a pleasure having you today. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I forgot the number off my I'll do that again. Now, what guidance is available? So you take a generic object, say a partition. Is that partition going to be used in a football stadium where there's going to be crowds leaning against it, or is it going to be used in a cheap house? And you're going to configure that partition in terms of say, so the materials inside it to give it different structural performance, depending on what sort of project you're using it on. And to do that, you need to really know your stuff and get quality technical guidance that allows you to configure that object for its for its project needs. Where did the manufacturer's information come from? What about interoperability? Let's just look at each of those. The first question, where does the information, where do the information rich objects come from? If you buy a tool such as Revit or AutoCAD, the objects you get out of the box focus pretty heavily around the basic geometry. So how far is the handle away from the door? What have we got there? Stop depth, thickness, tolerance, undercut. To make it look visually correct. There's not a lot of thought that's gone into the performance properties or the operation properties of that object. And that object generally has been authored in the United States 
and then sort of pushed into the UK market. And that's a problem for for UK industry if we're going to get the best out of them. What about standards? If everybody's authoring objects in different companies, or even within a company, if the person over there is authoring to a different standard to the person over there, you're going to get this sort of problem. So give me a schedule of all my doors, and then say, okay, tell me what the fire performance is. And instead of looking down at a nice column, it's going to be a squiggly. So one person's called it fire rating, one's called it fire rating without a space, someone's called it fire designation, and then someone's downloaded another object where they called it fire grade. And that, that makes your life hard, because then you've got to take the task of normalising it. If you want to do any ana analysis on this, you can't, because there's not that common language. So where do the objects come from? What standards are the objects authored to? And then what we were talking about, the guidance, and we talked about structural performance, but it's what yeah, if you stick on fire ratings, is that a 30 minute door, or a 60 minute door, or a two hour door? If it's around the kitchen, is that a one hour fire rating or a two hour fire rating? Is it a British standard 476 or 16341? What happens when that changes a little bit? N not everybody, well I say nobody's got all that information in their head, even the best designers. They need to refer to well-structured technical guidance and that slows you down unless it's structured in the right way that you get it at the point where you need it. And if you do pick a manufacturer's product, is it coming attached? Is that information coming attached with it? So here's four different doors from Leader to Shetland. What's the acoustic rating of the Vulcan 120? Do you really have to telephone that company and ask them? Or search their website and sign up for an account and get the catalogue and look through 140 pages to find out? Or do you get the object with the information inside and well structured? And how does this information go from one software platform to the next? Because if you think from briefing to FM, there's not one software package out there or one parent software company that's got solutions for all of that. You might do briefing with one tool and then write a specification and use an MBS, then jump across to AutoCAD, then pull it together and all the desk naps work and then upload it to some IBM FM system. And you don't want to type in that information every time you want it well structured so you get the uh, probability between the, the software platforms so someone's got the answer in the ring so do it this way <laughs> so they're the problems how can a company like ourselves MBS and working alongside the likes of them Academy North from University support the industry sort of fill that market market need I think one of the, the best places to go to, to find out about BIM is the UK government's BIM Task Group website. And they have got some standard information up there now, the sort of Kobe templates, drafts of past 1192, and so some sort of initial sort of property sets for objects. And the MBS, we're working with the, the government to define the property sets for these objects. So if you look at something like a door, keep on on door, the specification properties and just like scanning down here got things like well, radiation acoustic performance blast resistance a number of these properties have been defined internationally through IFC so there's an IFC door common it's got a performance property of uh, IFC fire rating but it doesn't cover the entire scope of what's needed in the UK market so what we've done with National Film Library which we'll come on to in a moment is Look at what is internationally defined, is an IFC. Look at what the maintenance properties are with Kobe, and then really extend that. So you've got a really rich uh, standard of national BIM library properties for uh, specification, for geometry. We'll maybe look at this in, in Revit in a second as well. And also, uh, sort of basic facility management, you say replacement cost, warranty who the manufacturer was, the model reference, etc. And for each one, give that a little bit of a definition. So some of this work's been done already by International Building Smarts, but in terms of plugging the gaps and getting a real sort of broad scope of objects across all of the disciplines, we're working with uh, government and also some focus groups, construction, product association, 
to, to get that right for the UK market. And what that means is a say a small door manufacturer in Sunderland or what have you can go to the MBS website or go to the government website and find out what that property set is. And they might have a tiny marketing budget. They can open up Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Access, or just maybe a little HTML table and can publicise all their information in that common structure. A manufacturer with a bigger, bigger marketing budget might want to create your sort of parametric design objects that can be dropped into Bentley or Vectorworks. And that's where our commercial model comes in here. So exactly the same property sets, but with the parametric functionality in the different design packages, uh, embracing IFC, sort of publicising it so it can go from one package such as Revit in with different packages such as Celebri. And what's been consistent across those three slides is the information sets. So if we look down the left hand side of the screen there, the information you see there in Celebri is exactly the same as the information you see in Revit, which is exactly the same as the information you see in whatever, HTML, Microsoft Word. Geometrically, it might not look as good as you go from Revit to Celebri, but the core sort of performance properties, FM properties, are, are con consistent. And one of the key things that's just really important for PIM adoption to work is to really get that complexity under the hood. So the, how the data structures work, how databases connect with each other, how clever the software is, it'll allow the construction industry to do what they do best, so design buildings, construct buildings, and not have to be completely skilled in every single thing, an IT expert, a software expert, because there's not many people out there that have that broad range of skills. And a, a really good example of that working well in the more advanced industries, I think if you think of Google Maps. So if you think the complexity behind Google Maps, it's just unbelievable. And you think the data behind what we're looking at there, the connected databases, the I don't even know what the term is, terabytes, terabytes, terabytes of information is incredible. But my grandma can come in and with a wheelie mouse zoom in on the north of England, on to North Tyneside, Newcastle, find somewhere and find out what their telephone number is. So not what's not of information, I've just gone, I'd like that bit please. And that's you only possible. Oh, we've been there in half an hour. We're a little cafe or whatever, pub in Newcastle. And then connected information, that's the view from outside it. And you just take that for granted, but the mind boggles if you think of how clever it is behind the scenes. And I think we're going in the right direction through proper information structures, classification, interoperability to get that working you know, for a building, or even higher than a building for a, a complex. So what you can see there is maybe a holiday village at the side of a lake. And there's no reason why you can't query that and say, actually, I'm interested in that building down there. And that's like the restaurant. So you've got lots of holiday homes and a gym and all the rest, reception. But I'm interested in the restaurant. And from that restaurant, go down to the particular floor you're interested in. And then say, actually, I'm interested in the, the, the washroom. And then from the washroom, jump down to a system. So maybe you've got a wash basin assembly that's made up of the wash basin itself, the taps, the waste, the proximity sensor, plug, what have you. So you're going from to building the floor, the space, the system, the product, and then really nail down to the actual property sets. You probably can't see that on the screen, but there's a little property there saying that the, the hot tap should be to the left and the cold tap should be to the right. And you've gone from a whole holiday village down to a particular wash basin and in a particular washroom through getting that data structured classification, the interoperability correct. And then jump all the way back out again. And it's a fantastic opportunity to move with BIM because it is sort of in development. And this is market research, international market research done by Autodesk for Europe, Middle East and in Asia. And when they look at the different markets, the size of the market is the the sort of size of the football if you like. And then you've got the, I think the capability on the left hand side in terms of people working on BIM projects. And then you've got the central government policy on the right hand side. Well, the central clients, it's not the government, it could be sort of big clients as well. And when they look at Europe, Middle East, and Asia, they see UK as being second only to Finland. And I think in the UK, that's just going to continue to 
to, to get better year on year on year and we're going to really push up there and challenge for that top spot and from a government's point of view that's fantastic in terms of value for money for construction when they spend however much they spend every year on new construction and maintenance at 40 billion or something but it's great news for UK industry as well because it will mean that UK contractors, software companies, manufacturers, architects can actually sell their skills overseas. So when does a build, building contract come up in Qatar or uh, India or wherever, we can actually export our skills uh, internationally as well. So digital revolution is happening across the world and it's, it's really happening in construction now, it's, it's sort of started. But when we talk about we've got to be careful not to get caught in the trap that it's all about pretty visualizations and wow, we can do crash detection now. We've got to think that a little bit further in terms of the information, the property sets behind the scenes. And if we can have standardized, well structured information in the, in the, the UK, it's really going to get efficiencies and help all the different industries around the construction industry grow. So that's the end of the PowerPoint. A few little useful. Actually, I'll, I'll show you that little website uh, just to start off. So I'm on 3G here, so this look at the website might just fall mm -hmm. over. This is our website, the mbs.com. We try to sell our products from here, but we also give out quite a lot of free information. And uh, if you look at the topic areas, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, it's going to work. I can try and log you in to the Wi-Fi otherwise. It seems to be just about coping. I only need okay. to do four or five. Okay. You can see these are the areas that we think are of real interest to the construction industry at the moment. So things like sustainability, contracts and loan, new building technologies. And two or three years ago we identified building information modeling as being a, a real sort of hot topic. And it has turned out to be so. So we go to our building information modeling area, we've got about I don't know, over a hundred expert articles, one from Professor Lockley, uh, so international experts overseas, and you can see what is it from an architect's point of view, a cost consultant's point of view, that's the little articles area, main contractor's point of view, etc. We've got a little videos area, where we've got conference videos, like little 15 minute snippets like I, I just previously done, we've got a two hour round table talking to the UK construction Chief Construction Advisor. And every year we also do a nice sort of consolidated 20 or 30 page report. Surveys 1,000 practices and gives that sort of trend and analysis. So I think it, it is quite a respected area, online area now when it comes to learning about BIM. So please, if you get a chance over the next two or three weeks, have a browse around and then see if there's anything that that will help you with when it comes to sort of research and topics, etc. Independently, what, actually one of our rival publishers did a, a big survey last year and said, where do you go to find out about BIM? And of the two or three areas that were, were named, they named the MBS website as being one of the, 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 the key, key websites for, for finding out about BIM. The last little sub-menu there is the National BIM Library. And that's our project we've done uh, in collaboration with BIM Academy. And that's going to take a little while. I'll just kick off Revit when that's opening. But what we've got in National Building Library now is about 500 objects, mainly across the architecture discipline. And 400 of those objects are generic, so a manufacturer is not mentioned, and all the values are blank, ready to be completed. And we've got about 100 now which are actually manufacturer objects. So you could download the uh, ceiling object from Canopy AMF ceiling. And inside that object will be all the, the correct properties that previously just been in their catalogues. Okay, I'll, I'll just show you in the context of a building rather than. So let's just have a little look at this building here. That's, this is the restaurant that the screenshots were from. So I'll just have a little look in 3D there first. So you saw it in the context of the a sort of holiday village before, but it's a, it's a reasonably simple model, just on one story, because we don't want to like show like, something over complicated. But it's predominantly been made using National Bim Library components. So I'm just going to have a little look through the, the floor, the floor plan here. 
and we'll, we'll go to that same washroom we saw in the, the, the screenshot. So if you have a look at this area here, the, the floor covering system, so whatever resilient tile floor covering system, the partitions, the external walls, the cladding, all of the sanitary wear from urinals to tiles to washrooms, mirrors, uh, the cubicles, doors, windows, ceilings, roof, they've all came from that central national library with the standardised property sets. So the advantage of that is if you're starting a maybe small medium enterprise in BIM, you're not having to create a, a BIM department to create these non-standard objects and paying that large salary because you can come to our website and download sort of standardised ones and sort of get going for free. In terms of the larger architects, it gives them a chance to sort of maybe consolidate what they've built up over the last three or four years, look at what we've done, take what they like and just sort of uh, dip in and out, maybe take the manufacturer objects and some of the generic they like. But I think the real big benefit comes from the, the, cli the big clients and the big contractors. Because every project they'll maybe work with a different architect. So you could get a big contractor like Alphabeti or Lang O'Rourke or Mace Group. And on one project they're working with Atkins, the next project they work with Ryder, the next project they work with the HOK. And they want to have that level of consistency. They don't want to have different uh, models coming through every time. And also as a consultant, uh, as an architect, I might work with an engineer and practice on this project and a different one. And just standardising that information is just a huge problem for the industry. And I think National BIM Library is really sort of filling, filling that, 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 that hole. Now let's just have a glance. I'll I, I, I just again show the drawing generation. That's a cut of the ground floor, which basically shows the layout of things. That same view has been duplicated and could have coded a little bit just to show the floor covering systems. So it's the same information, but you've got two different views at it. And if you change something here, like that door, it'll change in both views. Uh, and this is sort of the basic stuff, I guess. Here's one that just shows the furniture. Here's one that just looks pretty. I'm going to print that out in a big A1 sheet of paper and stick it on the wall. But this one's quite a nice view, the, the, the fire strategy here. So if I zoom in, you'll notice around this kitchen area, the doors are all colour-coded red and the partitions are colour-coded red. And the way that's been done is by having a little rule on this floor that says if you find the property fire rating and the value's got a 60 in it, colour it blue, if it's got 120, so two hour, uh, obviously way around, yeah, cover it, cover it red. So I can sit here now with the fire officer planning this building, and instead of having him have to flip between different paper documents, you can very quickly scan through it and see we've got a problem with this door because it's blue and it should be colour coded red. So I can just jump across now, click on the door, and then look at the information behind the scenes. And there's that well thought out information rich standardised property sets for the UK and down here we've got the IFC property set for fire rating I change it to 120 and you'll see the door changes from a blue door to a red door and there's far more complex things you can do in terms of analysis but at a basic level that just sort of highlights if you can get that consistency of property sets uh, what's possible signage objects are quite nice as well so these are proper 3D signage objects you can see in 3D but when you look at it in plan it's an oversized this is where the fire extinguisher is so I've just set fire to the chip pan there's the fire extinguisher brilliant I can't put out the fire how do I run out of the building I go that way then that way and then congregate outside so real sort of useful objects uh, the industry can use ok one thing we've got here I shall show one of the manufacturer objects uh, quickly just to show that consistency of property sets. Yeah, so ceilings here. This building's not quite as pretty. But what I've got there is a sort of little demo building, prototype building. 
and I've just showed you those some of the properties. And then these are probably going to be too too small to see on the, the, the screen, but the, this ceiling on the left here, just left it. I'll do the one on the right. This is our generic, so it says NBL exposed grid rectangular tile mineral fiber or something like that. Now the ceiling on the left is a fully specified manufacturer ceiling. That's the AMF. So you imagine doing your design, you, you'll stick a, a rectangle in to get the shape of the room, and then you do a bit of design on it using the, the generic ceiling. But before you pass that information to the client, you pick to manufacture it. At some stage, a manufacturer's product is picked. Like this is a carpet from ABC Carpets, and this is a table from Lockley Furniture. And as that flow goes, you need to have the consistency between property sets. And if you look at the schedule here, I've got all of the sort of well thought out properties all aligning between the generic and the manufacturer. Acoustic rating, finish, colour, fire rating, grade, material, mm -hmm. uh, etc. And you can see that consistency between the generic ceiling system and the manufacturer's branded ceiling system. So what we've seen there so far is basically Autodesk Revit's software. It could have been AutoCAD, uh, it could have been Bentley, but all quality information inside it. So we've used their structures to, to generate quality content to use at design time. What I'd like to show now is how that links with the software that we've developed here in Newcastle. So Autodesk, massive multinational company with billions of pounds, our, our little company in Newcastle now. So just to get a head around what we're doing, again, I've got a nice little simple, simple building. So I'll just have a little look through these uh, walls. And you see I've got a bath, I've got a sign, hand dryer, a couple of different types of door. So I've got an external solid door and I've got a couple of double swing. So nice and simple. And we've got a little plug-in in Revit here and what you can do you could put that entire design together. This is something we actually did for a, the Bill's Guitar Live challenge we did up here with BIM Academy. And click this button, and it'll go through all of the objects and generate an outline specification in our software. So I click Create Specification. This is take a little while, take maybe 45 seconds. And I'll just give it a name. Let's call it Northern Rear. And it analyzes the Revit model, and every time it finds a new type of object, it downloads the very latest specification clause. So if you imagine it was this room, it would look through the doors. So we've got three instances of the same type of door. It finds the first one, pulls the specification clause in, and then it will jump through the next two, because you only specify it once. With that sort of link between type and instance. So if we were all going to wear the same t-shirt, I'd specify the t-shirt once, but then we'd have what about eight, eight different instances of that t-shirt. So you can see what it's done, it's, it's analysed that model and pulled down all of those specification systems and created the specification. So we'll just have a little look at that, uh, that, that software package and how the, the two relate, and in particular the property sets. We've probably got maybe 10 more minutes and then we'll have 10 minutes for questions if uh, we'll, we'll wrap up at 6 o'clock. And if you scan down, you'll see all the different people I've done this demonstration with. So, where was it? It was in the demo location. There we go. So, North Maria on the 17th of the 1st at 20 to 6. And if we look on the left hand side now, these are all of the specification clauses. That first one there's the floor, there's the ceiling system, the external wall, chips and partition system, two different types of door. You saw the outside door and the inside door. There's your bath, your safety signage. And that's all there now coordinated with the, the Revit or the AutoCAD model. So I'm not getting too much depth about I'm doing a little bit, tiny, tiny bit on, on create. I'll open the ceiling system. Now, for these systems, we've got 900 of them 
across all the disciplines. So architecture, minor civil, structural, mechanical, electrical, landscape. And you, you can define a system as a, a number of products that come together to perform a function. So a ceiling's got the ceiling tile, it's got the support structure, it's got the grid, and they all come together to form a ceiling. If you were thinking of structural engineering, a steel frame would be a system where you've got a column, you've got a beam, you've got joints, you've got pins into the foundation or what have you. I think the service engineering uh, burglar alarm would have sensors, an alarm unit, the wires. So you've got lots of products, you put them together and form a system. And we've got 900 of these systems in MBS now. And you see we define our ceiling system by its support, fasteners, infill units, barriers, etc. Underneath these systems, you have the products. And we've authored the links between the systems and the products. And we've got 5,000 of these products. So what do you want for your infill unit? That little bit of square there. We're suggesting that you probably want either a metal tray or a mineral fibre or a plastic faced blah 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 or urethane foam. And we offer expert guidance on the right hand side. And when you make your decision, you've connected one of those 900 systems to one of those 5,000 products. And each of those products comes with that uh, detailed specification property sets to an extent that you wouldn't typically put into Revit or AutoCAD because you don't go to that level of detail. So VOC emissions, whatever that means. And there's your explanation of what a VOC emission is because not everybody, including myself, knows what a VOC, how you specify VOC emissions of infill units. Okay, so how is that information linked to Revit? We've got the little parameters in those objects. So let's just go to the floor plan. And if I want to do little, say, annotation callouts, I come to annotate in Revit. And there's the floor, there's the sign. Let's pull that across there. And you can see that title is coming directly off the, the, the MBS specification. So you're getting that bit of coordination between the drawings you generate and the specification that you write in parallel. Instead of them being just two siloed dumps of data. Typically on projects, the same person doesn't do the Revit model that does the specification. They might not even like each other. There might be some junior architectural technician in the corner and some guy with a bow tie that's the chief of the world doing the spec. And that's going to cause problems because the person that's writing the specification is going to make decisions. So let's get rid of that flow. Too expensive. So I'm going to remove it. And let's just tinker with some of the text because in our practice, we don't call them safety signage systems, we call them fire and safety signage systems. And that's on a real simple building, imagine an enormous building, how much coordination you have to do. And now we've got a problem, because it's saying one thing in the specification, and in the, the sort of main design model, it's saying another thing. And that's where this little button comes in handy. Come on. You click verify annotations and it'll go through the entire Revit model, the entire specification, and tell you where the problems are. So we're having a little look here and it's telling you most things are fine, but you've got a problem here because someone's removed the spec for the floor. And you've got a problem here potentially because someone's been changing the title. <coughs> so they might shout across the office, okay, what's your floor system now? And let's just add a new one very quickly put a tile flooring system in and then you shout back oh it's the Brazilian tile system so from inside here now I can look back into the specification and hook it up so this can't be automatic because they might have added two flooring systems and we've got to choose between the, the one that's, that's relevant so that's looking inside the specification you've still got to communicate and talk with your colleagues but you can very quickly pick the right one. And what's quite clever here is when you pick the correct one, what you'll notice is that floor system annotation will change from being the concrete floor to the tile floor. So it's a real time saver, robustness, risk management. And we go that little bit further down, watch the safety signage system there. That's going to change to what was fire, fire and safety signage system. And this little helper app is now telling us things are coordinated, get on and 
and issue all that out of your, your office. And then to finish this off, the last thing I'd, I'd like to show in the last three or four minutes is the information is not going to be trapped in MBS World forever. It's not going to be trapped in Revit forever. It, at some stage you want it to come out and, and be used in the operation of the building or go to the client who can't afford the license of MBS or, or, or Revit. And that's where, again, we've been working with BIM Academy, their expertise, and Steve Lockie's team to push that information into a neutral format, which is the IFC format. So let's just go and I'm going to specify the door a little bit here. So I jump across to the door set, and I'm going to add fire and acoustic uh, values. So I'm trying to do this as quick as I can. So what's the fire rating? Let's just add. I'll go really high, 120 minutes. Let's say it's incredibly high. We're going to go further than most manufacturers do, 150 minutes. And on the sound insulation, again, I'll go beyond what you'd normally expect. We're doing a radio studio and we don't want any noise to get out. 58 decibels. So you've got information trapped in one proprietary system, MBS. You've got information trapped in another proprietary system, Autodesk Revit. But you click this Create IFC button. And what this is doing is using Steve Lockley's XBIM components. So our software developers are going through our data model, analyzing it, and then using Steve's component, spitting that out to the platform mutable IFC file. I'm not sure if anyone's seen an IFC file before, but it looks something like, where's Northam? Northam with IFC. Let's just show that in Notepad. There's only about six people in the world that understand what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them's in the room. But the good news is the software tools that can read that in. But that's a durable, open standard format that 10 years from now, people will still be able to pick up and, and view the data in, in a number of software packages. So let's just have a little look at this package is called Salivri, but there's, there's many others out there. And a lot of them have free versions, so you can look at IFC. I think mean, Steve's developed viewers as well. And I'll just go and open that. Where are we? Demo on it. There it is, Northumbria IFC file. Bear with me here in a second. I've got a little. Uh, I almost forget how to do this. This one. I've got a little rule in here which queries the IFC and reports on particular objects. So I've got a little rule here that says report on all. Actually, I'll show you the spaces one as well. It's quite, quite nice. So you can create your own little rule using a nice little user interface. And then you say, OK, analyze this building and tell me where the spaces are. And that's telling me there's three different spaces, all on the ground floor, height, area. And this is nothing to do with us. This is just. The, what, what this software package does. But if I want to report on doors here, I say take them all off. And what you can see is the the door and the acoustic rating is 58, which is the one we selected. And the fire rating was that like, ridiculously high number I picked. But this part of it is still very much in the research point of view, but we've definitely shown it to be done. And we, we can use this on the, the build guitar challenge thing. Where you can map those key objects. So the door in MBS maps to IFC door common, or the, the window in MBS goes to IFC window common, and you can get that core performance uh, data into that IFC. And then the stuff that isn't defined in IFC, you sort of dump in the attributes. The, so I think that whole workflow there, and that mix between proprietary software talking to each other, and then open data as well, is it's a really exciting thing. And I don't think there's many people around the world that's doing some of the stuff that's happening here at Northumbria and uh, NBS down next to the central station where we are based. So, if you race through it, I finished the 10 <laughs> I said I would. Is it anything you'd like to see in a little bit more depth? Any questions? Uh, anything you'd like to ask Steve as well? Or? Um, I've got a question. Actually. I've got a few, sorry. <laughs> and please. Um, it's just when you're talking about <coughs> splitting the, uh, uh, you know, taking sections here, there and everywhere. Do you see uh, like in the future an age without uh, 2D and like, you know, automation? 
is progressively coming through. So rather than sending a, a drone set, a hard copy of a drone set, mm -hmm. sending through, uh, say, the IFC model with the specification attached to it. Yeah, I think that'll, when, I think that'll, that'll, think that'll, that'll happen. I think that'll happen in a sort of stage way. Mm -hmm. So some of the real big main contractors, I think, can probably get there, especially when they're all working together, collaborating, and you're not necessarily having to issue bits of paper about. Mm -hmm. But I think there'll be a big, big gap between the leading edge of the industry and the trailing edge. Yeah. And one big part of our business that we still make quite a lot of money on is actually selling our binders. So it's the, the book sales going down, and we've got about 900 architectural practices across the UK that still want the information, not just even in a basic software package, but want it in paper. The same as what we were doing in 1973. But we've got a specification one and product selector as well. So product selector is the free manufacturer catalogue, but we have a specification binders. And I don't know how they use that, whether they still photocopy and give it a separate house to type up Microsoft Word. But I think there's a big gap between what the leading edge will do and what the sort of training edge of the construction industry will do. So you want to work for a company that's at the leading edge when you leave here, not one of the ones that gets the bankers. Or you could integrate, you know, you could be one of those integrate, to integrate them into that. Or go and actually yeah. Yeah, leave from. But it'd be the inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to see we're talking about the building guitar live thing. Yeah. And that was a two day intensive design session, wasn't it? Mm doing the building and a, a group of architects came to me while they were doing it and said can we see what stage the plans are at and I went there aren't any <laughs> there's no plans well, and, that's what and, and they could not understand that, that we were designing building without formally handing plans to people and changing them it just didn't exist and there was no concept of plans in the whole project so what process did you adopt in that uh, I you know the checking of it because uh, obviously it's a uh, like a an understanding between the team and you know the collaborative effort for what so sign off uh, was that done by uh, automation or was that just done by uh, you know work set sign off or anything like that I mean they were working collaboratively because it was two days so it was intense yeah um, but in terms of um, automating sign off that tool that you saw there Salibri that Steve was showing is that's its target application that checks whether things meet the rules that are required I think that actual screenshot here shows that that was the design for Build Guitar Live, so it's like some awesome hexagonal type and that was on the edge of the, the BM guitar. And this is shown in, in IFC, the different models coming together and so on the left, the that's Salibri on the left. You had a space schedule in Salibri, didn't you, to check that you met the space requirements? Yeah. Is that the 60,000 square metre? Museum? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the space schedule. Pro the program, but we've got that same thing to recreate in the simulation. Okay. So this is quite interesting, but also daunting. <laughs> so is Salubri a uh, free license, or is it? We have a thing called Model View, which is completely for free. But if you want to do the checking yeah. and the take off and the uh, sort of constraints and things, that's quite dear, I think. It's about four thousand. About four thousand for the full version. I think we have some licenses on it. This is guitar live stage. Yeah, it's some of the, the shots. So this was done in less than 48 hours. One of the things that I find interesting is that there are a number of contractors out there now who are saying this is how they're going to tender for jobs. They're going to get <laughs> everyone together for two days and do this. And at the end of it, that's the tender. So is that a modern ice charrette type thing? Yeah. I mean, I followed it on the on the blog, but uh, mm -hmm. I think the MBS uh, in the Twitter feeds, and um, uh, we had the previous experience of George uh, Mokhtar doing it at the Northeast Web User Group, right. and uh, it seemed quite interesting mm -hmm. and yet daunting. But you right, said Jane was say, Jane Matthews was saying that you had uh, the landscape architect. Yeah. How was that? Integrated because obviously they're not. Is it, it's not. Is it, I don't know. Not familiar with it, but is it not as intuitive, is it? That went pretty pretty smoothly. Yeah. So they had the the whole sort of base that everybody worked off, and with the the coordinates, then the the landscape looked nice. Had the different sort of paving systems and grass and uh, planting and uh, sort of hard landscape scheming. There was one quite interesting thing, which is maybe a common mistake in in 
been really focused too much on the geometry. And their palm trees, I think, they'd worked on for a number of days, and they were beautiful palm trees. <laughs> but when I went to IFC, it changed a 200 meg model into a 1.4 <laughs> zillabyte one. So the, the palm trees had to get a <laughs> scale back a little bit. So when, when it was a circle with a round thing on top. There was also something interesting that um, I think two months ago, the head of the Landscape Institute, a uh, professional body, said that no landscape architect should use BIM. So the landscape people came along and there was no culture in the landscape of, of using it. But I, I understand that the people who came to do it from uh, was the name of the company then? Colour, was Colour Urban something, I think. Uh, they're actually now decided they're going to switch all their operations to BIM in practice as a result of doing this two days. So they learned from it how they could do it and they just went, it's, it's a no-brainer for us. So, um, a lot of myth out there. So, can't do, we'll do that type of thing. Oh, don't, we've not done it using the past, so why use it now? Uh, well, it's more, I think, that uh, as Steve said, that people perceive landscape as not being about geometry and they just perceive BIM about being about geometry and therefore they're not the same thing. But in reality, they got a lot of mileage out of it, didn't they? I think they were yeah, really yeah. impressive with it. There was also one about, uh, yeah, I was just curious with regards to um, the hardware and software application. Obviously, not everyone's, you know, you've got people with these smaller practices, technically, you know, two man jobs or three man jobs that are interested in adopting BIM um, and, you know, with the with the library as extensive as the BIM library, you've got a lot of those options that you're not necessarily requiring to have. So as radioactivity, if mm. you design like a restaurant, unless you <laughs> want molecular like astronomy, like astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some interesting things with castles. <laughs> yeah, but uh, do you, is there a chance? That, you know, is there a way to turn them off <laughs> during the prior to download or yeah, from not to be able to? In MBS point of view, what, what I demonstrated was the our sort of main most expensive package. But at the bottom end, we've got a tool called MBS Domestic, where you don't actually have to install any software. It mm -hmm. works through the web browser, so you, you don't have to speak to any customer service, get any consent out. You you go on a forty-five pound on your credit card, and you can actually write a specification online on the cloud, and then so sort of download the information at the ends, either in uh, Excel in a structured format or it's a PDF if you're going to send it to a so we, we sort of cover customer bases from someone doing a kitchen extension all the way to someone doing a new terminal at sort of an international airport. Though. And it's fully co 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 coordinated throughout, like it's consistent throughout, so you know. You the functionality is a little bit better for the for the high end, but not a lot yeah. better. Yeah. yeah. But we, we do have the, you can annotate from the domestic version as well. But in terms it's of just sort of slide and scale, the, the bigger you are the more money you've got, the, the better content and better functionality. Mm -hmm. guess. It's just, yeah, I mean, I think Peter, uh, Peter Barkham in yesterday, which is not obviously both of them now, he was talking about certain, so many different uh, contractors and so many different architects working on one uh, one thing. It's varying ranges of sizes, and I was just wondering how did that work out or anything. Um, and I'm assuming the domestic uh, in MBS specification is consistent with the with the, the MBS creator, so MBS building, as you would suggest. Yeah, it's the same technical office of item, yeah. go for consistency. And of course, you could have something really complex on a small project. Yeah. I think some rich person that owns a house wants to have some incredible solar panel system. And you could have something really simple on a big project, so it's not necessarily. Uh, There's also a big issue about time because, y you know, you might have a job where it's, like Steve was saying, it's really important at the start of the job that you specify in detail this thing, but this thing you don't care about until six months later, or even when it's in use. So you can't put every single property onto every object all the time. You've got to, and, and that, there isn't actually, at the moment that's a real problem I think, no one solved that. Because at the moment we are just getting to grips with it, so for instance Steve showed you there that they've got properties that you use for maintenance, like warranty period and guarantee and all that kind of stuff. But if you put those in, which we have done, would an architect on the first week of a job have any idea what values to put in there? No. So it's actually just un annoying information for them. And yeah. 
and th there's issues now trying to get them to fill these slots in with values because the culture isn't there to fill them in. So there's there's no answer to that. It's people are still now they're getting rich data, they're coming to terms with how they're going to manage it. But it's not resolved yet. I think this is where BIM uh, execution plans come in and you will have to specify what richness of information needs to be available by some specific gate in time so that you know that your design is complete or it's maybe missing some information that were required. This is something that's a bit sort of secret, but th this is a mock-up of the, the government's website but with the object property sets in. And when we talk about object property sets, we're not just talking about a table, but the building itself is an object which breaks down into a classroom, which breaks down into a, we went through that before. So if you start a building, there could be the property sets that define a building. Very fast, Steve. Not too fast? Yeah. <laughs> now, if I'm at the stage of, are we going to do a building or not? So that real initial business case stage, there's so much distraction there, as, as Steve was saying. So I might want to filter it by the digital plan of work stage to stage zero or stage A. And all you have to really care about is what's the function of the building? So you could be the architect extracting the brief from the plan. Well, why do you want the building and what's your budget? So, okay, well, okay, you do want a building, you've made me the case and you've got enough money, we'll go on to the next stage now. And then you start looking at maybe buildability and operation strategy and then you go further and what are the number of floors and how does that map onto and that, that works for objects as big as a building or as small as a, a door. But that little bit of guidance of when you need to fill in that property or when likely is the thing that's really missing at the moment. And that'll be a system in the BIM execution plan, obviously. At, at the moment, this is getting defined from a, a government client point of view, where we're a small client, we know exactly what we want, we want this information at this stage. It's, it's an incredibly detailed BIM execution plan. If you stop putting the disciplines against it, so the staircase is going to have the responsibility of these property sets with the structural engineer, but the architect's going to finish the uh, aesthetic design. It is, it's an incredibly ambitious thing to, to, to try and do. So it's mocked up, we're talking about it. It's, so I, well, that's supposed to be done by December. Yeah, of course, because <laughs> Spy did it in the United States seven years ago, it was all finished, didn't Yeah, it? right. <laughs> the interesting thing there, though, is that uh, that's kind of the COVID data set you're pointing out there, Steve. Is it related to it? It's the same principle, yeah. Same principle, yeah. If you look at some of those properties, Steve, out there, operational oh, expenditure, yeah. it's all right. So, um, the, if you just look, say, where was it? Any one of those, really, but if you see down there, it says capital cost and operational cost. You would think anyone commissioning a building that would be pretty much paramount. How much is it going to cost me to build and how much is it going to cost me to run? And yet, you have to struggle to fight to get that information out of the design team. They won't want to tell you that. I mean, they, they'll, they'll resist it until the very last minute when you're just about to go on site and say what the building's going to cost and how much it's going to cost to run. So that's why clients really want this because they want the information right up front so they can start making proper decisions about things. And that's what BIM does, it gives you the power to do that. So now they're formally stating, I want this now, at this stage in the job, not in six months time or when you fiddled around with it a bit. And so consequently the industry hates it. So there's a backlash coming from contractors and people like that because they really don't want to be this transparent to people, especially clients. That's why in Italy, the business was done on the bottom and on the left because we are trying hard to resist to any of this transparency. <laughs> <laughs> Change is good, like Claudio said. Yeah, um, probably. Yeah. Change is as good as the rest. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. nice to meet you all. Yeah. Thanks. Hopefully, you get a chance to check our website out and. Yeah. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Do you call me?